How's it going, everybody? We are here with Grace from Blockchain for Humanity and, of course, Jeff McCabe, the CEO of Divi. Thanks so much for sitting down with us today, Grace. This is wonderful. Thank you for the invitation. I am very, very pleased to be here. For sure. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm in Costa Rica and she's in Switzerland. And uh, we talked a little bit about the pandemic, like we all, everybody does before all of these meetings. Everybody kind of catches up. It's always interesting to hear. But today we're going to really talk, try to focus on the technology and the blockchain and I think solutions. Uh, one of the things that people ask me all the time about blockchain is like, well, what is it good for besides Bitcoin? And I always use blockchain for humanity and, and, the, and some of these ideas as an example. Um, but I've never really taken the time to dive deep into it and it's it's something that i think that gets ignored a lot you hear about it sometimes in the news but i'm really interested to hear how this is being applied and what kind of tools are really available and how close the world is to having maybe at least one government adapt this you know so i have a lot of questions so i'm excited to hear from you i'm excited to share so where do we start <laughs> <laughs> well so can you tell us about blockchain for just give us a story i guess to start with okay so the story goes uh, back in 2017. If you remember, this was a time where we had all these ICOs and you know this madness going about tokens and tokens here, tokens there. And nobody really cared about what those tokens actually did. But as long as there was a token, there was an opportunity to make a very quick investment and see how that would turn out. And it was a, a time that we realized, you know, this is not blockchain. The, the blockchain that we sort of signed in for. And this is not the technology that we thought we would actually have and support. So when I say we, there were, we were a group of early adopters. So this is a, a bunch of people. I, I don't even go into the, into the specific names because I just call it the people that thought blockchain should be used for good things at that point. But we were not sure that we were going in that direction. So the idea was, you know, no, it wasn't the idea. The first question was, is blockchain really being used for good things? So prior to this sort of questioning and, and reflection, I co-founded what is called Giveth. I don't know if you, any, any of you heard of this. This was one of the first platforms we had on Ethereum, donation tracking platform. So it was a very experimental, this uh, Giveth.io was meant to be a DAO at some point. And, you know, we started with the idea that uh, people should know where the money goes and give transparency, you know, light into that black box of the, of the charities where sometimes you don't know where those funds are going to be used. So that's what brought me into this space from the beginning. So Giveth gave me the opportunity to really understand what this technology actually does and, and the capabilities of it. And having understood that and going through my you know, usual rabbit hole process where you can just, you know, block everything else out of your world and you just read, read, read. You know, sometimes people come and, and check you and talk, knocks on your door and see if you're still alive because they haven't heard from you in hours and you're still reading about something. And it was that fascination that really showed me that this technology had, you know, a limitless opportunities to change not only the lives of people, but you know, societies as a whole. But it was very early at that point. And um, Giveth gave us a, you know, a good start on that. But when we went to, to create Blockchain for Humanity, it was more about understanding which use cases had been created, which use cases were there to, they were actually proving that this was really for the good or for the benefit of all. And that's when we decided that we will call for, uh, for an award, for applications for an award. And that's how the Blockchain for Humanity Award started. So essentially we started because of the award. And it was to find out who is out there actually using the technology for social impact. Let's find out. So the first year we got about 20, actually 18 applications. And the usage was, you know, kind of platform related, there wasn't, you know, too innovative, let would say. This, the following year in 2018, we, it burst. So it was three times that. And then we, we saw the effects of the kind of ICO because every 
every solution had a token. So we also saw a, a different way of actually applying the, the technology. They were going to be doing something good with it, but it was always about the token being the utility token within that platform. We didn't see that as the, as the major innovation factor. The third year and the last year was, uh, was a bit you know, more of a, I would say inspiring and encouraging because you can see now that there is a good tendency to go into the social economics aspects of the issues that we confront in, uh, you know, in vulnerable or fragile communities. So we're looking at solutions that are giving an alternative to groups that have been excluded or to communities that would have no access to certain uh, resources. And these tools are giving us that particular um, solution. So we're looking at community uh, inclusion currencies or community currencies as one of the, uh, in, my, in my personal belief, the true use case that shows the potential of this technology. And I will tell you a little bit about what that is and, and where it has been applied and how are we looking to scale this in different parts of the world. So we also looked at, um, at the technology to being, uh, you know, the one that allows us to make uh, two parties uh, trust each other as the premises of our blockchain and have a peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, interaction. So this is specifically for farmers. Uh, in, in this context, we are looking at incentivizing the, um, the use of, uh, of, of technology to provide the funds to farmers in need to harvest their, you know, whatever is it that they are harvesting. In this case, we have a, a particular uh, project called uh, Ethic Hub, and they do this for farmers in Mexico harvesting coffee. And what's happening is that, you know, we don't understand a lot of the stuff that happens and it's, we are ignorant about the situation, but we know it's bad. And when we find out what the real situation is, you see how bad it is. So these are farmers that need a loan of about $3,000, no more than that, between three, less than 5,000 for sure. And they need to go to loan sharks because they don't have a bank account. They don't have any credit. Some of them, you know, just hold only a name even. So yeah. go to a loan shark and the loan shark char charges usually 100 to 150% of that loan. So it is, um, it is rather a world that it becomes so unfair for so many people. Mm -hmm. Then you, you hope that this technology helps us you know, sort of overcome that gap. So these farmers are now getting loans from people anywhere in the world here in Europe, for example, they send uh, two or 3,000 and they get the, the loan for a period of time. This is locked for about six months. And there is a, um, a process that is being followed. There is a, a communication with the, the lender and the, and the beneficiary. And now after the, the harvest is done and they have recuperated the money, the money is sent back to the, to the lender, to the, to the person who lent the money. And until today, there has been zero default. Wow. So, so what like, is, so what, is yeah. the no, what is the interest rate on a non-loan shark sort of farmer loan? How much, how much is considered to be a reasonable loan in this case? Somewhere between 10 and 15. So it depends on that. It never goes above that, and it doesn't go below 10, because it does, it's not then interesting enough for people to do it. So okay. it's between 10 and 15. So if you're here in Europe, for example, you know, what you would get for that money is about, uh, you know, less than 1%. Mm -hmm. It's the, the interest here is so low that, you know, 1% yeah. lucky to get. So, so, how are, so how is that money being applied? Like we, we, were, we were talking about doing some things like this in, in Africa and our contact who works in a in in africa he said pretty much across the board if you want to do anything like this you can come with all kinds of great ideas with technology but you're going to find yourself blocked by the government because there's always these very corrupt people and yes. the only way to get anything done is to cut these guys into the de the deal somehow you know and we're talking about the president and the the, the heads of the banks and you know they're all the same people and um 
so I'm just wondering, how do you, I mean, I'm curious, like, which country specifically and how do you sort of get this legalized and get actual fiat money that the farmers can pay um, for the seeds and the thing and the, and uh, the things that they need to do the farming. How do you get from blockchain into dollar into dollars or whatever they're using? So there is uh, the, the company that does this, which is Epic Hub, has a a foundation here in Europe. They get the money, they transfer the money, and depending on on how the money has been um, invested. So either there has been you know cryptocurrency used cryptocurrencies ether in this case or dai because everything gets converted into dai in the end to be able to manage that uh, stability of the of the pricing or it is uh, also received in fiat money so the this this foundation gets sort of in charge of exchanging that money giving it to the uh, to the farmers ah, by the way so the farmers are not individuals not individuals that will seek for this loan they need to form a co-op Mm-hmm. So only as a cooperative that they're able to come into the platform. And oh, that's be- a great idea. So yes, yeah, so yeah, that-, that creates a sort of peer, peer pressure among them to make sure they pay it back. This, so. this has been a very well thought model, I, I thought, because it does. So it, you know, one of the reasons is everybody wants to be trusted and everybody wants to show that they're you know good at repaying and they want to build some credit so that they can ask for higher amounts and. When you have a group of people that are all part of getting the benefits out of this, they, they're making sure that each one is actually putting their best forward, right? Mm-hmm. And so the, what, one of the projects we're working on is called Maya Energy. We have a partner, and he's the one that I was telling you about a minute ago that is working in Africa. And, and what he's doing is he's creating these solar-powered uh, containers, like a 20-foot 20 foot, 20 foot container. They build them in Italy and um, possibly in Kenya, and they ship them wherever they need to go. And people can basically buy, you know, communities can buy one of these containers, open it up, and put, make a solar, a solar-powered system that can create uh, clean drinking water. It can um, do a whole bunch of different things, like it can run solar, uh, solar-powered cell phone towers if they need that. Um, it can power tuk-tuks for, for different types of uh, like small communities that need, need that, that don't want to have uh, gasoline or diesel powered. And, and the, the main application of this is taking these things into remote areas where it's really expensive to get gas or diesel. And, the, and, and the, 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 one of the cool things about this is that he just goes to the people in charge that are already making money that are running the diesel generators, you know, maybe they're corrupt or it doesn't matter because in this case, he shows them a way to, these things get financed, they get to make more money, but at the same time, they can charge less for the clean drinking water or for the power that they're they're generating. So it's very much a win-win. It's very good for the environment. What's and so he's, it's called Maya Energy. I'll, I'll give you a link afterwards. Um, the, He's been a friend of mine for a while, and, and uh, he was in, actually introduced to me by a, a friend of mine that I met in Costa Rica, who's a, who's a Swiss lawyer. And um, it's a really great situation because it's using technology, and everybody wins in this case. It's very good for the environment. And so what he's finding to do is tokenize this, and so that people basically can support this idea by buying a token, and they get the thing, it's profitable, right? So people buy a token and they get paid back and that payback will be in Divi. And so that's sort of how we got involved, uh, right? So, but, it, but we realized in doing this that there's going to be amazing opportunities to work with groups like yours. I'm sure there's probably communities that, need, that would need something like this. They get it free of charge. They pay it over time. It, it, it reduces their costs. Um, and these things could actually become in some ways community hubs, like where p- people could go to charge their phones and the people themselves could invest in the tokens so that they're getting some money back. Or we could have Divi as part of the local economy. They're getting paid in Divi and we can, you know, with Divi with our wallet, we can provide bank accounts. One of the things we're looking at right now is try to f- trying to find a way to provide bank accounts using the the fintech we have in Costa Rica to people that don't have any any ID, so people that you know that, that don't have that, and 
and I've been talking to a few companies that are that are looking at ways of doing social sort of a social ID system where if you have enough sort of votes from other people that either do have an ID or or perhaps um, perhaps like a a priest in a local church signs off the because we're in Costa Rica, we have a, a little bit more flexibility with some of this than other sort of, order, sort of banking environments have. Um, so there's a whole bunch of opportunities with what we're doing to work with uh, with groups like yours. Um, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of waiting to talk to somebody. I want to talk to you after all this to kind of go over because I've never. I, I just I just know there's some great use case here for these Maya thing, these Maya containers. But I'm just not sure what it is yet. It's just there's so much opportunity. So about, um, it seems like this it's is that is, uh, so what, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So what countries are you working with primarily for for this system? So it really goes. Uh, in different directions, but uh, the, the the model that proved to be the case, the use case that that validated the uh, the value that we can find in community currencies, for example, this is so the social economic aspect of the of what this uh, technology can give is really something that I am very much interested. In. So I think this is this is this is the place in which we can do something significantly impactful. Right. Everything else has a, 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 a good um, intention, but I see as this to be the, the strongest aspect that where the technology can affect some impact. And in the community uh, in, uh, currencies in particular, uh, Kenya has been the model that proved to be validation, right? So now you have about 25,000 people that are using their own currency, and that has been, um, implemented by Grassroots Economics, which is the foundation who takes care of that, by Will Ruddick, which is an amazing, brilliant mind, who, mastermind who's behind all this with a huge heart. And what he has done, it, he, he has uh, created the, um, the, the, the currency, the, uh, the, yeah, the digital currency, in a way that they can also use their normal feature phones, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a, there is not the smartphone, but the feature phone that is connected to the USSD, like the, that connection to, to be able to exchange uh, money or, or currency through the phone, right? Like they would use M-Pesa for. Yeah, I was just gonna, oh, that was my next question. Is, is it, are you getting pushback from, from M-Pesa? Uh, no, because it's different. I mean, M-Pesa does use the, the fiat currency, the national currency of Kenya, the shillings. And this is not, uh, let's say, I wouldn't say competing, but they understand that this is, it has a geographical uh, sort of value and it's within a, a red of, uh, of, 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 or network of people who accept it, who have contributed with uh, some kind of a service or a product to be able to use that currency and then interact with other ones in that same network, right? So that's the whole premise of the community currency and what we, what we see and why we see this uh, such a such a great value is because during the COVID, what Will Ruddick found out was that in these places where you have people living under the poverty line, they were trading every day at a minimum of seven thousand dollars. And you you ask yourself, how is that even possible, mm -hmm. right? So there was this exchange of value exchange of uh, yeah, interaction, monetary exchange, that was still happening when the whole world had just stopped, let's say, you know, in so, in so many words. And then you find out that these, these communities, which could be the first ones who are so vulnerable, and, and you would see this in Latin America, for example. I had um, friends in El Salvador that, you know, if you are locked down, you can't eat because you go every day out there to find some money to get food for the family. That's how they work. So if you lock them down, they can't eat. That's mm -hmm. essentially the, 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 the vast majority of what we these underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped countries are suffering from. So these people were trading. And what really made it uh, very clear to me that this was a system that really allows them to have that resilience in such a pandemic was the fact that it didn't matter if they were not getting because they had enough of that uh, uh, you know, local currency 
to buy food, which was the first necessity. The second thing was certain um, medicines that were available at that uh, rate, and then certain services that needed to be along that. So if you cover the, the, like the, the, the most uh, you know, urgent needs, your day goes by you know, normally. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the other way around when you can start then going desperate. And even in developed countries like the U.S., you had people that were in similar situations where it just, they just needed to go out and work. You know, sorry, I can't stay at home. I can't lock down. I need to feed my family. I need to pay for this roof. So same situation. And so this is the model that we feel we want to start scaling. So what we're looking at yeah. the, at the role now is to kind of create a different layer. So we have different uh, la- layers of implementations, right? So you had the, the M-Pesa, which they exchange electronic money. Then you have the community currency, which is now a digital currency, backed with a collateral that has been already put in reserve that comprises products and services from that particular community. In addition to that, you have organizations like the Red Cross, who have donated for aid to certain, uh, certain uh, areas, certain, certain villages in Kenya. And this donation, for example, it was a $40,000 donation that normally would have been given as cash donation or as a food donation to a particular uh, village. This uh, $40,000 were put in that reserve. And as, an, as, a, as a result of that, a number of, of uh, tokens or currencies were issued and then distributed among the, the community. Yeah. Instead so, of giving the aid to them, it's put in the reserve and then you issue the, the, the currencies to the community and airdrop them mm-hmm. so that they can start interacting with it. So uh, I have a few questions, but what blockchain is being used for all this? Do you have your own blockchain or are you working with Ethereum or EOS or... So, so we are completely blockchain agnostic. One of, the, one of the first things that we needed to make sure we will make a decision upon at the beginning of all this journey was to find, to say, okay, either you marry a technology or you actually look for a problem and see which technology better fits my problem, right? Which technology actually addresses this problem in the way that this problem needs to be addressed and not kind of fixing it to that technology. So from that perspective, that's what we give value to and importance. Therefore, we are agnostic. So Mm -hmm. if it's EOS and it works well in EOS, we support it. If it's Mm -hmm. Ethereum, if it's RSK, RSK is actually one of the the protocols that we work with, but also because they're very well known in Latin America, people trust people that are there. So Mm -hmm. that's also one of the of the ways in which we want to be able to scale any type of solution is to see where the trust is. You know, if yep. people are already use a particular, so in Kenya is Ethereum and that's what they trust. So then, you know, there's no reason for you to change. We're actually having a pilot. We are, we're gonna, we're getting ready for two pilots, one in Spain and another one in Brazil. I'm very excited about that because both pilots would allow us to understand what it means to implement these community currencies with different technologies. Always blockchain, but different technologies. And now we're using sort of a little bit of the DeFi type of uh, aspects to it, decentralized finance, and we want to implement the community currencies with a bonding curve that allows them to create two markets. So it's, it's getting a little bit sophisticated but it's getting to a point where you know that how far you can take this technology, but if you take it with a mindset that you just want to build value and bring benefits to a community, then every decision that we make goes around that. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's the guiding principle to this. So in, in, for example, in Spain, I know people will say, but you know, Spain is not like an underdeveloped country or things like that. I don't know. People may think that that, that, that should not be a place where we go. But actually, they're, they're very um, deserted, I would say, areas in Spain, which people have left because there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. You know, there is, a, but there is still a community that suffer the consequences of just having this exodus of people because the young people can only find jobs so far away. 
Right. I think it's it's an interesting challenge. So you you take different levels of uh, of of challenges of issues to address, and this one in particular is to create a local economy for that area. Mm -hmm. So it's an area that doesn't have this. You go if you walk through the main street and you see and the and the and the name of the street is the the shop street, the, the street of shops, and you see not a single shop that is open, then you realize, okay, there's something that can be done here. So we're trying to see how we can create this sort of, um, first bringing the community together, and that's, that's one aspect that is extremely important. So these decisions need to be made, not by a group of people, but, but by the entire group of people who are affected by this. And that's probably the hardest, that's the hardest and, and most challenging aspect of it, right? So bringing that community together, making sure that you can define which services and which products can be brought from there into this collateral, see that they actually agree, commit to it, actually make them sign a, a commitment, uh, you know, sort of a paper, if you will. They need to, to understand that this is not a game because, you know, we would all just waste our time in, in less than, than a month when you, when, you, when you actually get started with this, if you don't have the commitment. So it's a promise that you are giving to your future buyers. I'm gonna give you this service. I am gonna take care of your children for 10 hours at this amount in the future. So I'm committed to that. I sign it and that goes part of the collateral. So let's say we build a collateral of 10,000 euros or dollars then we issue coins for 40,000 so 25% is actually kept on reserve and then the rest will be then used by the community to exchange services and products yeah doesn't it because you're using sort of different coins and different systems for every different community it seems to me that that creates a lot more overhead and it creates less value because for example if you were if you have if you had two different countries next to each other or two different communities that were maybe within reach of being able to trade with each other, if they shared a coin, then they would be able to, it would give that coin more value because it could be used elsewhere, or you might have extra liquidity in one community that could support another or do a loan or, or, or support in some way. So it seems to me that what the natural thing would have been to create your own coin that all the communities used and sort of create sort of an old, you know, almost like a global um, farmer's coin or something like that. Um, it could be less, it was less, be less to manage at the same time. Or is, is there some reason not to do that that I'm not thinking of? Yeah, there, there, there is a, there's a good reason for that. The reason why it is that community's currency is because it's the community's own currency. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost like they have made their own bank. Yeah, so they feel a sense of ownership and maybe they name it something that appeals to them and they get to vote on that. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's, that's the first to be able to spark this sort of collaboration and cooperation between the community members. So if I come with my Grace coin, let's say, it doesn't have the same effect. So really building the community from the point of, that they are actually creating their own currency is already a, a huge step towards. And we get inspirations from, I don't know if you ever heard of the Banco el, La Palma in, uh, in Brazil. That's how it got started, is community currencies. Uh, and this is probably one of the best use cases. Obviously not digital, but also the reason why there isn't one that can be used for multiple uh, communities and so on is because then you start competing with the national currency. And then you start getting into different type of regulations in that sense. Mm -hmm. A community currency is considered more like a voucher, kind of like, you know, like a, like a miles type of uh, club where by you can exchange these miles for services and so on within these boundaries, right? So that always has a one-to-one, -one, um, um, what do you call it, a peg to the, to the national currency because you obviously need to have something to reference it to. But it doesn't compete because outside of these boundaries, it's not accepted. Or well, outside of these boundaries, it's uh, you know it's it's within these boundaries, and this is probably a, 
the challenge, but also what makes it uh, being able to be implemented. Yeah. The governments will not have then an opposition to it. Even though Kenya had very difficulties at the beginning because the government were not used to actually see something like this happening. And they, at some point, because they started with, uh, with, with paper, they thought that they were falsifying. So they were creating fake money. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore they were charged you know, for this as a criminal yeah. charges. Yeah. So it was you know, kind of like the history of how it started. But then as we moved to digital, it was then other challenges that came along. Right. Well, and if you have people that are funding this from overseas, it's actually bringing in foreign reserves in one way, right? So it's actually enriching the country and, it's, and, and nobody, nobody's losing in the local economy. So it, so it seems like a great model. Uh, I have a question for you. I, I talked to some people at one of these big Asian exchanges once and they were saying that they have this program where you can, you can basically lock up your Bitcoin that you're that you have in the exchange and they give you 6% interest on it. And I asked them, well, how is it possible that you do that? Like, what are you doing with this Bitcoin? And the person was like, well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but we have this micro loans program that we give the money to in Indonesia and they loan, you know, the Bitcoin gets cashed out for dollars. This is all going on behind the scenes, right? They cash it out for dollars and they loan it to these farmers so that they can buy seeds you know, they're basically loan sharking and then they get the money back and then, if the, and then we buy the Bitcoin at the end of the season and we have these micro loan programs. And so that, so they were very much, the exchange was very much operating like a bank where they're just trying, and, and this person admitted, they said, we don't really make that much money on fees, you know, at our exchange. We're just trying to get as much money in so we can loan money to these farmers through this micro loans program. And that's how this, this exchange actually makes money. It has nothing to do with crypto. It was just sort of, in a way, sort of a front for getting in cash, other people's cash, who are, people are willing to sit it there so that they can loan it out. And they're not telling anybody that they're doing this. But it made me think, like, have you ever considered going to exchanges and setting up very transparently a program like this where people can, using their the money that they, that that is sitting in these exchanges, set up a program where people you know get six or seven percent for their bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies then you guys charge 15 percent and you help create and you find some liquidity for the programs since you have such a good payback rate it seems like and as long as you're very transparent about it and give it a you know a cool name and people know what 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 communities you're financing it would be this it would actually be this great thing where everybody everybody wins right so have you thought about that as a exchanges as a source of potential liquidity for the program? I have uh, thought about exchange in, in general, also because in, in no matter which case you would implement this, you would always have that on-ramp and off-ramp situation where you need to find out exactly how they're going to be able to, even with the community currency, they have, for example, a, a person or a, a shop owner will have to have certain amount of that currency that they can take from people, but then at some point they need to get supplies. And those supplies are not being from the, you know, coming from the community, they have to source this from elsewhere, which they won't be able to use their coin to get. So there is a, a limitation whereby it says, okay, sorry, but I can't, I can't accept this current uh, anymore. I'm gonna have to start getting fiat in order to meet my quota to bid to get the rest of the supplies for the next month, let's say. Mm -hmm. So that, that is an issue and that is something that we are looking at to see whether an exchange, maybe like a kind of, I don't know if it's naive to say, but a universal exchange would allow us to do this on run and off ramping of the, of the people with the, with the currencies and so on. But when you come and, and talk about specifically these uh, micro loans, I, I really like them. And I, uh, I, I do support this, uh, this microloan uh, movement because it really it, it reaches the, the people that normally would have reached. Now, when you pack that into the Bitcoin and the volatility of the price and so on, you, you are already creating you know, a, a bit of a risk there. We are a not-for-profit foundation and we are not allowed to take this type of risk. So we wouldn't be able to do it ourselves. So 
the way we work is that we support any type of organization that has a purpose, a clear purpose in which they want to use this technology to bring that, uh, that benefit to society or to humanity, let's say, and we push that forward with them. The, uh, the implementation of the coins, we haven't done it ourselves yet completely, but now we're gonna start experimenting, you know, creating a small team that will do that just to see which technology actually works. So we are more of a sandbox, if you will, to make sure that we're looking at what technology can do what for whom, you know, kind of finding out where, where are the, uh, the op opportunities, the areas in which we can actually address the issue and how this technology is serving that, that opportunity. So that's where we sit. And, and I, I usually call it in that intersection between social innovation and purpose-driven development. So all the, um, the, the awardees, let's say, that get the Blockchain for Humanity Award become part of this sort of network that we work with. So we connect them. Most of them are actually doing something that is complementary to each other. So we try to make them work together. Or if they are actually going into a particular region, we try to get them to have synergies to get into that region together with the services that they want to provide. So we kind of look into different ways in which we can create this, uh, this impact that we're looking at. But yes, but to, to answer that question, we have looked into this, and this is something that is very interesting in a less volatile place. So we still need to manage that risk uh, side of it. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm wondering, is there a, just a, a simple way for people to participate in this? Like, it seems to me that if you had some sort of app and people could just, you know, click on a button and put some, some of their Bitcoin or money into the program, you make it really, really easy for people to do it. Do you have something like that, that people can participate in this? So we don't have an app, but we do work with donations. So, you know, kind of, being part of this, meaning that we get the resources to be able to move on with this project. One project that is actually quite interesting and people could, uh, could probably benefit from, from knowing about this as well, is this uh, very small community in El Salvador, it's called El Zanto, El Zanto. And they have, similar to the case in Kenya, they have already implemented the use of Bitcoin in that very small town. And this happens because there was a very generous donor who gave this uh, charity in El Salvador the first tranche to get started in this small Bitcoin community. And now it's, become, it's called Bitcoin Beach. So you have certain numbers of uh, stores already, uh, places uh, that, that, that take the Bitcoin, and some of the people are even earning money in Bitcoin. So what's happening here is very interesting that during the pandemic, because the Salvador was very restrictive, uh, very strict in, in enforcing this, uh, these rules of lockdown, people could, were not able to get out of the house and so on. And uh, the, um, the charity gave a donation to everyone in that town, a small donation, but nevertheless a donation that meant food in somebody's uh, table. And the donation was sent to everyone's wallet, like yeah. that. They didn't have to go out, they didn't have to say, and then they, they make sure that they would organize the, uh, the main shops in town, will mm -hmm. receive the orders, will receive the payment in Bitcoin, and then they will send somebody with a, with a purchase to each one of these uh, places. So the, um, the people behind this, Michael, uh, it's, he, he was laughing about it. He's like, you know, these people that are, that are, you know, this very poor, poor, poor communities are getting first class service like Amazon. You know, they're yeah. getting delivery of the food just to their doors. And, um, and that show you as well, you know, you know, how do we build this type of uh, resilience in communities? Because it's yeah. about, you know, this, this sort of situations and what we have lived really proves yeah. The best El Salvador, yeah, El Salvador sounds like the perfect place for that. I, I'm pretty sure that El Salvador doesn't have its own national currency. So then you're not going to have a country like El Salvador, or I think Ecuador, countries that use the U.S. dollar, you're not going to have pushback from banks that want to make money off of, of fractional lending, right? Where, where right. 
any type of any yeah. any type of alternative currency is is a threat to their business model. Oh. So it sounds like a great idea. And and we wanted to create a, this, a similar situation in you know that uh, that area between uh, Venezuela and Colombia, where there is all this transit of refugees going back and forth, and we're talking about a million, a million point two a day that goes in and out, right? Many of them continue. Some of them just go in and out of in that particular area. So we thought yeah. it, strategically, this is an area that will benefit from being able to even earn in cryptocurrency, understand what cryptocurrency is, how to trade, how to win, how, how to exchange value with it. And we wanted to, well, we, I wouldn't say we want it, we still want, we still want to be able to go in that area, have an educational program and allow people to earn in cryptocurrency. So if they continue their journey, this, this is something that they will already have you know, learned and perhaps share with somebody else. But I think this is critical. But we have very, very um, strict government governments in both areas. Mm -hmm. So there is a um, there's a fine line here, you know, whether you do it right or you do it really, really wrong. So yeah, yeah, you can develop technologies that can get people into trouble when they start using them. That's one of the problems we face in the United States, where. You know, we have this technology we're developing where you can just click a button and open a bank account in Costa Rica. But the United States citizens, if they do that, those because of the, you know, the, the banking laws and the reach that the U.S. government has, if, you, if, you're for, if you're an American citizen and you open a bank account anywhere in the world, you get reported immediately by the IRS. I mean, it's literally in the code. It has to be created this way. And so then you get reported to the IRS and then if they don't re report it, they can get a $50,000 fine. And so you can't just open up bank accounts for people. You need to make sure they know like, by the way, if, when you do this, you have to, you know, fill out this extra form and your IRS, yeah. on your IRS uh, and stuff you at the end of the year. So we, you, you can end up putting your, your, your clients and your fans at risk if you don't do things right. And so that's part of, you know, what we have to do. I'm sure you have to, worry about that too when you're dealing with countries like Venezuela exactly. or, uh, or India is another one, right? That's potentially at any moment going to add some draconian laws um, of some type. And so anybody participating in this suddenly gets, gets put at risk. So trying to educate people. Uh, Argentina is, good. is also in that, uh, in that bucket as well. I mean, but these are countries that, if there are any countries that need this, it's actually this country, mm -hmm. Venezuela and Argentina, especially Venezuela, yeah. everything that happens there. In fact, we have two of our projects in Blockchain for Humanity were inspired by the situation in Venezuela. So we have one that decided to create this uh, donation platform, but uh, physical goods, not money, but physical goods like chicken. And it's called actually mm -hmm. Pollo Pollo. So okay. it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, and it was inspired because they said, you know, medicine, uh, you know, uh, tomatoes, things like that. And they, they said they couldn't believe, and these are people in, in Denmark, they could not believe that other people in the world could just not have food. They, they, they said, we, we can't, we can't uh, accept that. So they created this platform and they're using it there. And it's it actually incentivizing, the same thing, incentivizing local producers to be part of the platform so that they're the ones who exchange it with the person who actually is going to get the, the donation, the beneficiary. So that's, yeah. that's working really well. And there's another, another one as well that was also inspired by Venezuela when, the, when she found out that uh, these people were dying because they didn't have basic medication. Same thing. So she decided that she was going to create this sort of traceability for uh, for donations of uh, medicines all the way to the to the to the recipient, right? So these are all incentives that that are there that we know the the technology can give us the capabilities to track this, to know where it's going, to know if it actually reached the the the, the destined um, recipient, yeah. but very difficult implementation wise you know to get these projects to really scale and get that massive adoption because there's always about the government or the you know the mm -hmm. laws or the regulations that will hinder them from actually making right it. so 
So I have a question for you. I have a, like a perfect test use case and you can maybe tell me how you can help. Um, I live in a small beach community in Costa Rica called Montezuma and we have a, a private school called Futuro Verde and it's about half like foreigners that live there. Their kids, a lot of them were born in Costa Rica, so they're Costa Rican citizens and half local Ticos, the Costa Ricans. Mm -hmm. It's a great school and it's very community oriented and, and they, some of the people, it's, you know, it's a nonprofit. They came to me and they said, Oh, we want to make our own cryptocurrency. And they had all these crazy ideas, but their, their problem was this. Nobody, it's, it's a tourist community. Everybody makes money from tourism and there's no tourism. So they can't afford to pay the bills for their, for their kids to go to the school anymore. And so they wanted to create a cryptocurrency that they could pay their employees in and have the rest of the communities accept this cryptocurrency. So, um, so basically their idea was, you know, they had a, a bill of say, you know, 20,000, it wasn't that much, you know, $20,000 or $10,000 a month. They were going to just start paying their employees in. And, you know, the teachers and just everybody and they would give them some some dollars or colonies, which is the local currency, and they would give them some Futuro Verde coin or Verde coin or whatever they wanted to call it. They, they didn't know much about it, so they're just giving me this idea. And, and they said they'd already talked to a dozen or a couple dozen local stores and restaurants and this kind of thing that said that they would accept it, right? So... So I was kind of one. So I was kind of coming up with different solutions. I remember there was a, a group out of Brazil and Costa Rica called B Spiral. You may know them, and they had created a system for this, uh, for for creating local community coins, on on EOS. And now they've changed the name. I don't remember, but it was called B Spiral. And um, but do you have a solution that would work for them? They want to create this, you know, local coin. Could they just easily plug into what you're doing? Should I put them in? in in touch with you and can you solve this problem for them or what should what should they do and what kind of problems do you see with what they're trying to do so i i need to ask you first a question have you heard of cambiatus they're in costa rica cambiatus, a, cambiatus. so who's, these, who's, hmm? who are the founders of that? yeah i think that is what I think that's what B Spiral used to be. I think they changed their name to that. Yeah. 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 They've actually been. Yes. Oh, yes. The, the one yeah, in Brazil. I... They're, they're running the one in Brazil as well. Yes. Cambiato. So this. Yeah. We... Okay. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. They've been to my. They've, I've met them. Been, they've been to my farm. I, I have a. I live in an eco village that we're building here and they've been here. So. I, that, that, and those were the, the, the people I was referring them to talk to. But also thinking through the whole game theory of all this, you know, what's going to work? Where are the weak points of this? Is this all going to collapse at some point and somebody's going to get stuck with all these, all these Futuro Verde coins that they can't spend? And is it going to come and turn into some disaster? Because these things, you know, the tokenomics of these things are tricky, right? You just, you, so you have experience with this. So I'm kind of wondering how you see this and what would, what would they need to do to make this happen? So this, this is a, uh, an interesting question when this is a, one that you have to also have a little bit of that crystal ball to tell you what's actually going to happen. But right. in general, this, um, this, the, the use case that we talked about in Kenya started because students were not going into, into class. They, they, they're not going to school because they didn't have enough to eat. So the whole um, situation was triggered by this and by giving them this sort of local currency not only were they able to pay the teacher which was never getting paid for for teaching the students but the students now had uh, the, uh, the 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 accessibility to food in school so that was a situation that really was the trigger to the whole thing this in this particular case i think something similar so i see some similarities and it has nothing different from a community currency. So it has all the aspects that are uh, lined up in order to create a, a, a community that commits to take this in an exchange for something else, right? 
So in this particular case, you're saying that they're issuing uh, a number of, of coins and they want to pay the employees with this. Would the employees be able to get food with it? But the question- well, that's, yeah, yeah, that was my first question. And they said, well, there's a whole bunch of restaurants that are going to, said that they'll accept it. So, but you know, but I didn't think that was food. It needed to be a grocery store. <laughs> exactly. It's not food, definitely not food, because in the end, you have to make sure that you take the basics, the real right. basics covered, right? So food is the first one. So who takes this coin in exchange for food? Well, like in this, in this particular case, we've, at the same time, as soon as this COVID thing started coming, I knew what was gonna happen. I knew this was gonna be a disaster. And so we started planting you know, create, trying to create new garden beds and building new greenhouses and sort of ramping up to be able to create more food production. So I told them, I said, look, we'll try to ramp up all the food production we can make so people could pay us. And and I was the idea was to create a community oriented because we couldn't afford to pay our workers because we lost our our tourism dollars. I said, well, let's just let our workers create their own CSA, community supported agriculture. They can create the food and they can take this coin and sell it to all the people that need food for this coin. Um, but, you know, trying to ramp up with a lot of food production is it's not easy. You know, we're in the middle of that right now. But that was one possibility that we could do it. Um, and it does incentivize but, the local production. No? Yeah. But then you, you, get to, you get to the point where, okay, so well, then our workers end up with this coin. What can they do with it? And they're, they're mainly from Nicaragua and they don't necessarily want to eat these delicious organic vegetables we're growing. They want to eat rice and beans and chicken and, and stuff. And they want to buy it as cheap as they possibly can, you know, from the local supermarkets. And so can we talk them into taking the coin? So it, this is where it goes, right? Like one thing after the other, trying to create a whole ecosystem where everything's involved and how can they pay their rent with this? And we actually came up... So I actually, I actually suggested a model to them. I said, well, why don't you offer a buyback program where at the end of the day, anybody can cash this out. Um, and the school would basically, so it becomes sort of a loan coin where the school would offer, after this is all over, to start paying, say, 10% more than the coin originally cost for to pay it, buy it back. And that way you have... If, if the coin ends up being accumulated by anybody anywhere, they could actually make money by selling it back to the school. And the school at that point, when it has its income again, would just, just have to budget for that and would have to you know, have big sales and parties and all this to raise extra money to help to pay off the interest. And so we seem to have found a way to make it all happen. Um, they haven't done it yet, but um, yeah, I was just wondering, I think it's I think it's a cool little microcosm that we're kind of working on in my little town, and I'd like to, I'd love to see it happen. So um, that, yeah, maybe I'll prob I'll probably come back to you and your smartest people. You can tell us all the things wrong with the the tokenomics sure. we're working on. But um, finally go over that. But in the end, I'm very glad to have met you. It needs to benefit everyone, you know, and not just a group. Yeah. that's uh, probably the, the the challenge that you you're in. Yeah. Now. Well, great. Great. And thanks so much for all the information, Grace. Where can people in the community not only donate, but where would you like to send them to, to learn more about the projects that you guys have? Well, I, I, I do want to just say one thing and, and maybe have a reach out to the community. One of the, the visions that we have for the missions is to reach out not only to people who are in, the, in this space uh, as like social entrepreneurs, but people that are in the space that are just, you know, having their own for-profit business and there's nothing wrong to have a for-profit business as long as you have a purpose for that business. And one of the areas in which we feel that we need to kind of reach out to is this entrepreneurs of this space. We want to make them a model of, you know, tech companies that actually have a cool tech to to show for, but it's a tech that at, that at the, at the end has a purpose and a clear way of getting that to, to that purpose. So this is not just for the social entrepreneurs, and that's what I wanted to say. We, not, we, we need to be inclusive with everyone, and we would love to hear from them. Our website is uh, www.b4h.ngo, and 
it will be nice to hear from anyone who has a cool idea. We're here to actually entertain them and discuss them and address them. And even if they're such cool, then implement them as well. Yeah, I would love to just build this into our Divi mobile wallet so that there's actually a panel that people can click on. It opens up and it's blockchain like that. handy. And you just and you just give a one click thing and say, OK, donate to this. And and, you know, you have a bunch of we have a bunch of cool photos and maybe even short videos that show the different communities. And this is how much money they need. And exactly. if you want to support this, click this button. And then it just has a little tracking function that shows them paying you back. How much you're getting how much you're getting back and make it really really easy for people to participate they don't have to go to any websites or learn anything they can just you know talk to each other and people are really busy right so you make it really easy to participate in what you're doing i think a lot of people will do it especially if they're making a little bit of money on it they'll love to do it exactly and and there's nothing wrong with making money <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that as long as we don't go the other way <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, this sounds great. So thank you for joining us. This has been wonderful. Yeah, this has been thank awesome. you for having me. This was really wonderful. We'll we'll keep in touch. Yes.